Howdy howdy friends and neighbors, this is your old pal B coming to you from deep in the jungles of Borneo. This segment of Radio Farside is brought to you by Balihai Beer, Indonesia's finest handcrafted and award-winning brew. And by Patreon, where good folks like you help bring quality content to the non-corporate media. Is there evidence for an ancient civilization that spanned the entire globe? Why do specific symbols and iconography reappear in religions, art, and architecture in all human civilizations? Is there a hidden history and a wisdom that can be discerned by studying humanity's ancient monuments? Stay tuned. You can help us grow by subscribing, liking, and sharing our videos. We would also be most grateful if you clicked over to Patreon and became an active supporter of our efforts. You can also support Radio Farside by checking out our blog site and checking out our unique and unusual products from Indonesia. In any event, we hope you enjoy our efforts. There are nearly a thousand articles covering hundreds of uh, topics and a growing library of videos with some of the deepest thinkers around. Be sure to leave a comment and tell us what you think. Richard Cassaro is an author and journalist who has studied the extensive occult connections between religions, architecture, secret societies, and an hypothesized ancient civilization. Richard writes for Rizzoli Publications and travels the world, presenting his compelling research into the religious symbology that spans time and space across the planet. Without further delay, let's explore with Richard Cassaro. And Rich, hi, welcome to Radio Farside. It is really a fantastic opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Bernard. I, I appreciate your invitation, and it's good to be here. Well, I, believe me, uh, the, the honor is mine because, uh, as I mentioned to you uh, previously, I, I came across your article on triptychs uh, written in stone about uh, two years ago, and uh, it, it gelled a lot of things for me. And in art history, of course, we talked about the cathedrals and the three doors, uh, most of the professors, you know, told you the standard answer, well, it's the Trinity. Uh, one of them really got into it and said, well, it's a, you know, a representation of the female genitalia, which you can almost see it if you look at it. Um, but then I read your article and it, and it just, it pulled together so many things that, you know, I've seen these, these images everywhere and never thought about it. How, how did that come to you? How did it gel with you? You know, I've always I've always had an eye for the triptych. I've always been looking at it when it was in, you know, cathedral architecture, church architecture, uh, a lot of New York City architecture, Manhattan architecture is is triptychs and I I grew up going to Manhattan a lot and seeing a lot of these buildings that have the triptych. And so it was always something, you know, that I, that I saw and noticed, but never put too much. I noticed a lot of things. That was one of a million things. So I never put too much emphasis on it. But, you know, little by little, I'd say it started on my first trip to Egypt when in 1996, mm. I started to notice the repetition in Egypt of these ancient temples. I started to notice that, you know, not just one or two, but a lot of them had the triptych three door entrance. And that's really when I started to say, Wow, this is in, this is probably where it started. I started to think to myself, and of course, in Egypt, the triptych temples are all crowned. The center door is crowned with mm. the Aten symbol, right? With the mm -hmm. with the sun and the wings and the, the serpent. So basically, I was like, okay, I know that 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 symbol itself is one of the most important symbols in all of ancient Egypt. That, along with the Ankh cross, I'd say those are two of the most powerful and prolific symbols of the Egyptians. So I, I felt like, okay, I'm onto something big here. It wasn't until uh, a couple of years later, I, st I was traveling more and more. I was in Mexico. I saw the triptych in Mexico as well, you know, created by the Mayan civilization. That, to me, was major because I was 
was already into the whole old world, new world parallels. You know, the uh, the idea was of Atlantis, this lost continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it was destroyed by a cataclysm and survivors fled to different parts of the world. This is an, a very old concept. And these old and new world parallels like the idea of the pyramids and mummification and things like that, a lot of scholars said that the reason why these are similar on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean is because of Atlantis. That's the Victorian era scholarly take on it. And right. Many great minds were thinking that back, you know, a hundred years ago. And I read a lot of their books. And so finding the triptych on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean was big for me. And not only that, but it's the temples. You know, this is big. It's not just some insignificant hieroglyph that I found on both sides. It's the temples. And the temples is where we go pray, worship, you know, learn about the spirituality within ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. So right. To me, that was, you know, I started to realize then and there that I was onto something very, very, very big. And then, you know, just to finish it off, I was in New York City studying architecture years later, and I noticed I was in front of Rockefeller Center, uh, you know, where they put the big Christmas tree every year. Right, sure. There, yeah, there's a triptych there, and I and I knew it was a triptych. I was looking at it, and I said, you know, there's a triptych here. I, I had noticed that in modern art architecture there was the triptych, but at that point I had learned that the two outer doors of the triptych stand for the pairs of opposites, and the middle door stands for the higher self, the soul within. And on Rockefeller Center, the right hand door is the male. There was a there's a male figure um, atop the. Uh, the right, the uh, right hand part of the triptych, right. and on the left hand part, there's a female on top of there, and in the middle, there's a god, and so it kind of I had like a, an aha moment. I was like, okay, this is major. This, this is it. Whoever designed this knew that uh, you know that this is the, the the secret history of the triptych. And then, if you notice, the god in the middle has a compass. He's holding a compass straight down, and th this was probably well, I don't remember the year, but it was a long time ago. And, you know, a lot of people, I had never even heard of Freemasonry. So I had started doing some legwork and research, and I recognized that the compass in his hand was the part of the square and compasses of Freemasonry. Right, yeah. So that led me to Freemasonry, and then I, and then I kind of pulled it all together from there. Wow, that, yeah, I mean, that, in fact, I, now that you mention it, I remember those, those images over the doors at uh, 30 Rock. Um, Wow, that's fascinating. But, I mean, I guess the, the part that really blew me out of my chair was, was the fact that it shows up again in, in Maya culture. It shows up in, in European culture, in Egypt, in India, uh, Cambodia. Uh, if I'm looking at your website and, and the photos here, uh, are literally from all over the world, and in, and in places you wouldn't expect, like uh, Shriner temples and uh, whatnot. It's just it, it's incredible that that the symbol is right in front of our faces and nobody sees it. Yep, it, it is. It is incredible. You know, a lot of people talk about you know secrets hidden in plain sight, things that are hidden in plain sight. Right. And I believe that's true. This is a perfect example of something that is literally hidden in plain sight. It's hidden right before us, but we don't see it. Um, our minds aren't, aren't looking for it for some reason. I have a theory as to why. I think that, you know, in, in our modern culture, in our modern education system, I think that we're not given the tools to learn how to think on our own. I think we're taught what to think. We're taught we're not taught how to think. Right. And so the, this whole idea of curiosity, another thing too is we're kind of brought up to believe that everything's been figured out. You know, everybody's been studying everything and, and you're born into a world that everybody already knows what it's all about. And and you have to, I, you know, I hope young people are listening to this, you have to click that button and say, you know what, nobody knows anything. You're here to <laughs> discover everything. You know, it's all about you're discovering everything. And that's the attitude that I've had for a long, long time. You know, luckily I had my own teachers and my own viewpoints. I was pretty headstrong as a, as a teenager and that type of thing. And I didn't like authority at all. I still don't. So, yeah. you know, 
the idea that, hey, you didn't figure it out. I'm coming here and I'll tell you what I think. I've always had that attitude. So looking at the architecture, I was always – I never believed that the church architecture was the Holy Trinity, uh, that the uh, the triptych symbolized the Holy Trinity in mm. cathedral architecture. I always looked for something deeper than that because, you know, if it does symbolize the Trinity, then which is what – you know, you have the triptych is a main door and then you have the twin outer doors. I guess you would say that which which is God in the middle and then you have the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ on both sides, it doesn't really make sense. And th- mm-hmm. and to be honest with you, the Holy Trinity never made any sense to me at all. And I studied the Bible for many years, and I read the Bible from cover to cover many, many times, mm-hmm. looking for answers. Because, you know, as a, young, as a young person being brought up Catholic, you don't really think about the Eastern religions or the esoteric traditions. I was very, very young, but I was always interested, and I always wanted to learn more. And I figured, okay, the Bible has all the answers. Let me read there. Mm. And I you know, I did pick up some information in the uh, in the New Testament, but I rejected that very quickly when I started to understand the esoteric tradition, and when I started to look into the Eastern uh, religions and the and some of the uh, the wisdom traditions that are held in the East, like the Third Eye and that type of stuff. That really is what uh, what opened my mind to to wider possibilities. Well, in fact, the the third eye concept seems to tie in with things like the uh, the rose window in a cathedral, or um, oh, gosh, I had a brainstorm there a minute ago and I lost it. But <laughs> uh, yeah. the over archways uh, throughout Europe, you you find this this rose symbol above uh, the the arch doors, uh, and it's almost. Uh, to me, it seems like it ties in with the third eye concept quite easily. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. It's something I talk about in my articles and in my book. Mm. You know, in just just as a, as a quick, you know, the Gothic cathedrals, um, especially the the Gothic cathedrals of northern France, which I studied at length before I actually wrote and published my book. I did a little cathedral tour just to, you know, uh, study and know what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. The Gothic cathedrals, what are called the Notre Dame cathedrals of northern France, they all have the same design and layout or a very similar design and layout, almost parallel design and layout. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I noticed was that the Western facade of these buildings, it is identical. They're all identical to each other. So, and I looked in, I can't tell you how many books I read and how many books I looked into and how many scholars I talked to and nobody and no book and nobody ever talked about it. So I said, okay, this is me. This is, this is my job now. My job is to point out what I call the cathedral code. And I just came up with, you know, cathedral code has got the nice CC alliteration and, you know, it's kind of mysterious, but that's mm-hmm. what it is. It's a cathedral code. It was created by the builders of the cathedrals and there's three main parts to the cathedral code. There's the triptych three-door entrance. Mm-hmm. There's the rose window that you just talked about, which crowns the center door mm-hmm. of the triptych. And then if you look face on to the cathedral, there's two giant twin towers, just like the twin towers are very similar to the twin towers in New York. They're, they're giant and they look like they ascend up from the twin outer doors. Mm-hmm. So, in time, after reading books and, and after, um, you know, speaking with, uh, scholars and occultists and things like that, I pieced together that this cathedral code was created by the medieval Freemasons and they encoded not only the triptych design, the ancient worldwide, you know, triptych design into the Gothic cathedrals, but they surrounded the triptych with architecture that explains the triptych. Mm. And very quickly, let me just say one thing to, to your listeners who don't know. The triptych isn't just a design that I discovered in different parts of the world, like in ancient Egypt and in, in Mexico and in Peru and things like that. I found the triptych in all these ancient civilizations. But in my book, I explain how each ancient culture – use the triptych to signify the same, what I call, universal religion. Mm. So because it was their temples, they all 
had the same universal religion. They all believed the same ideas, the, the same doctrine, let's say. And that doctrine is encoded in the Gothic cathedrals. It was put there by the medieval Freemasons. And you're right to, uh, to point out how the rose window is actually the third eye. But it's more than that. It's all, it's the soul as well. It's circular. And the soul is circular. We read that in, in, um, Carl Jung, in Joseph Campbell. They tell us that the soul is a circle. Right. Why is it a circle? The circle be- ha- has no beginning and no end. So a circle has always been symbolic of eternity among ancient cultures. So the concept of a circle symbolizes eternity. The rose window is actually a circumpunct, meaning it's, uh, it has, it's not just a circle. It has a dot in the middle. The dot in the middle is the, um, is the non-moving eternal part. The rose window is is a giant eye, the third eye, that sees the soul within. And that's the concept of the third eye. Your two eyes see outward at the material world. When you open your third eye, it's designed to look inward to show you your soul. You are your soul. You are the hired being that is temporarily... Um, inhabiting your dual body. That's what the triptych is. The triptych is the number three. The middle door of the triptych is the God within you. It's, it's leading you to the set. It's the center point, the balance point. When you walk through that center door, you're finding the God within you, the true self, the higher self, the, in Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, who's in, who's framing the middle door? Jesus right. Christ, the right. Christ within you. Okay. That's the, the twin outer doors are the doors of opposites in every single ancient Ancient civilization, I think bar none, the idea is is that the world and the universe is created of a duality. There's light and dark and good and evil and male and female. And that's a concept that you find in every ancient culture and every esoteric tradition. Mm -hmm. So the outer doors of the triptych stand for the twin opposites. And in order to find your center, in order to find that God within you, that higher self within you, you have to walk between those two doors. You have to balance those two opposites in order to find the center within. So that's the idea that uh, that the Freemasons of medieval times, the operative Masons, encoded into the Gothic cathedrals. And that's what the Western facade is all about with its triptych three-door entrance. It's um, it's uh, rose window crowning the center door of the triptych, which, by the way, parallels the Aten symbol in Egypt crowning the center door of the yeah. Egyptian triptych temples. And then you have the twin towers, which are, uh, again, because they rise up from the twin doors of duality, those twin towers symbolize duality. Well, and I, I kind of symbol, uh, not symbolize, but I, I kind of uh, match those with the uh, the two pillars of Joachim and Boaz that that appear in the, the Freemason uh, uh, temples, uh, the sun and the moon, the the two opposites. Do yep, you, that's do you exactly get that same that. symbol. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's exactly what they are. That's exactly it. In written in stone in my book and on my websites for years, I've been posting information that basically says that um, the Jacob and Boaz pillars in Freemasonry we have those on what are called the tracing boards. Mm-hmm, right. And there's a lot of tracing boards. There's not just one, but most of the time on the tracing boards, the Jacob uh, pillar is on the right and it's capped by the sun. And the Boaz pillar is on the left and it's capped by the moon. And so you have these twin pillars, one capped by the sun and another capped by the other side is capped by the moon. And usually between them, almost like a triangle, forming a triangle with the Jakin pillar and the Boaz pillar being the two lower points of the triangle, mm-hmm. between them is the apex of the triangle. And that's the what Masons call the all seeing eye. The, right. The Eye of Providence. Now, when I first started going to these Masonic lodges in early 2000, everybody kept telling me that was the Eye of God, the Eye of the God of the Bible. And, you know, I, I, um, I rejected that pretty quickly because to me it was very clear that that was the third eye because it's in the middle. Uh, there's only one of them. And if you look at the great seal of the United States, the, um, the, uh, one of the, one of the images there is a pyramid with, uh, an unfinished pyramid that's completed with a triangle that has an eye in it. Right, right. That eye inside the triangle has been discussed and, you know, so many 
so many different ways, but to me, it's very clear that it's the third eye. Why do I believe that? Is because the triangle itself. Look at the word try. Mm-hmm. Try. That means three. Triptych. That means three. Mm-hmm. Third eye is three. And in fact, the Masons talk about the number three more than any other number. It's the most powerful number in the universe, and everything related to Freemasonry, the rites, the rituals, the symbols, the ceremonies, is focused on the number three. Right. Why? Because the triangle, the shape of the geometric triangle itself is a triptych. It has twin lower points, right, that are parallel to each other. And those, tw- those are like the two outer doors of the triptych. And the apex of the triangle, it matches up to the center door of the triptych. And so when you have, when you have a triangle, you're thinking, you're already seeing a triptych. It's the same meaning. The twin doors of duality are the two lower points. The apex is the center door. And then when you have an eye inside of that, mm. well, you know, reconciliation of the opposites, the balance of the opposites, the number three, an eye, it's very clear that that's the third eye. Why is it depicted over the pyramid, the over the unfinished pyramid? In Written in Stone, I explain that my idea is if you look at all the ancient civilizations, they all had pyramids, but there's something more. They all had unfinished pyramids, and that's a very, very, very important detail that I don't really hear anybody else talking about. You know, the unfinished pyramid, why was it unfinished? Well, lots of reasons, but, you know, the idea here is that the Great Seal of the United States seems to be reflecting those unfinished pyramids. And not only that, but they're telling us that the third eye in the triangle completes the, um, the the unfinished pyramid, and so and that's a concept also that you find in masonry, the unfinished temple. It, right now, it's Solomon's temple because the uh, the modern um, modern masonry has come down to us through the uh, the Hebrew mysteries, the right. Jewish mysteries. But in in times past, I, it wasn't uh, the Temple of Solomon; it was the pyramid, and I have strong evidence for that. Well, and, and what you're saying brings up the the thing that's really fascinated me about all of this is is the the prevalence of the number three and multiples of three. Uh, you have three, six, nine, twelve as mystical numbers. Six three times is apparently the the number of the the uh, beast in the Bible. Uh, the, there's what twelve apostles, twelve tribes, uh, which are all three times four. This, this three thing just keeps coming up. And, and what have you found about the number three that makes it so, uh, what, so ingrained in our culture? You know, it's based on the idea is if you look at um, the human body, for example, there's you can cut a, a line straight down the human body, and you're seeing two symmetrical sides, okay, mm-hmm. for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you get to the head area, you're starting to see a single something. Again, you're looking at, you know, what a triangular shape almost. You're seeing the twin lower sides, <clears throat> the left side and the right side, which are the two lower points of the triangle or the two outer doors of the triptych. Mm-hmm. And then you're seeing the the head, which is the dome, um, you know, your, your skull is often called your dome. That's the, that's the apex. That's the balancing point. That's the higher reasoning point, right? If you look at the U.S. Capitol building, for example, the, the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., it's a, it's a triptych. It has three triangles, three massive triangle pediments. Um, and you, what it is basically is a giant triptych with two, uh, parallel outer, um, triangular pediments, and then you have the uh, the dome in the middle. Hmm. And the dome, if you look at the dome, there's an eye in it. If you go inside and you look straight up, it's a giant eye symbol right beyond the head of George Washington. Right. A lot of people say that's the apotheosis of George Washington. He became a god, but I don't think that's true at all. For me, what's very clear, and this is backed up by a, lo- a lot of years of occult tradition and ancient cultures all believed, you don't become something. You don't you, you don't become a god. You are a god all ready mm-hmm. you've fallen from the heavens life that this is this isn't rich Casaro talking this is um you know thousands and thousands of years of ancient cultures and esoteric tradition talking the idea is is we've all 
you've fallen from heaven. A soul, you're a soul, an eternal being, a circle, a non-material being who's fallen down to this lower world of duality. You've fallen from heaven. And so you never stopped being a god. You're incarnated in an animal form right now. Mm. And so that body kind of covers up your godlike powers. Um, I think it was... Um, uh, was it Emerson who said man is a god in ruins? Yes, and that's yes. a beautiful statement because that's exactly what the occult tradition teaches. We are still that god only now because we've taken on a physical body, an animal body. When we look in the mirror, we don't see that god. We see the changing flesh. You know, the flesh that changes from a child to a, from a, from an infant to a child to a teenager to a young adult to an older adult and then finally to an older person that is eventually going to die. See, that's the mortal. That's the the, the mortal coil that we shuffle off. Mm-hmm. Who's the we that shuffles it off? That's the eternal you. That's the God part of you. And just real quick, I, I don't like to read stuff during interviews, but this is really powerful stuff. You know, there's four quotes I'd like to read. According to the ancients and according to this tradition, you know, we are a God who's having a dream of ourself. So, yeah. Right. So that's what this is. It's a dream. And that's a good way to put it because that puts the power right back where it belongs inside of you. That's where the power is. That's where the divinity is. That's where the eternity is. And here are some good ones. Rumi says, this place is a dream. Only a sleeper considers it real. Then death comes like dawn and you wake up laughing at what you thought was your grief. Good one, right? Here's another one. The nursery rhyme that we all know, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is just a dream. Right. right. It's a good one. Two more. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. And then finally, Arthur Schopenhauer says, the universe is a dream dreamed by a single dreamer where all the dream characters dream too. So you see, and that's just four quotes. I have literally dozens and dozens of quotes by very reputable and famous um, authors, writers, poets, etc. And the idea is that nobody has trapped you in this world. I see a lot of these modern quote unquote occultists online who talk about all the evil and all the people that are in charge of us and controlling us and controlling the world. Yeah, I believe there was an invisible government and there is an invisible government that's, you know, the cronies of of business and and politics mixed together i see that as well but you know what this concept of the universe is a dream and you're the one who's dreaming it that puts the power right back where it belongs with you because you have all the power it's your higher self that's in control of everything you're the ground of your own being and don't be afraid of anything that's that's the key don't be afraid of anything because you're controlling it all you're not conscious of it but you're controlling it all you know, that's that's an excellent point, and, and something that I've tried to drive home to people is is uh, don't buy into the fear. The fear is what kills you. The fear the fear is actually can kill your spirit. It's it's when you release that and just figure that you know nothing. You you are invulnerable. There is nothing that can happen to you. You are you are the pyramid. You are indestructible. And and it is a very empowering message and, and something I think people really need to take seriously. Yeah, really. I mean, honestly, it's only when – it was only when – and this was years ago – only when I really started to say, you know what? I have to stop studying this and really put this into, you know, into play in my own life. Mm. And I said to him, there was a point where I was reading a book and I, you know, I won't say the name of the book, but I stopped and I said, and I put a note in the book and I said, from this moment on, I have no more fear mm. and I'm going to change my life and I'm going to do, I'm not going to believe that I need to work 40 hours a week for somebody else to make a living. I'm not going to believe that I can't become that great writer that's going to influence a lot of people and tell them the things that I've learned over the course of my lifetime. I'm not going to believe any of that. I'm going to make my life exactly what I'm looking to make it. And I, and I realized that not everything is in my control and that's good too because 
I'm open to things that are happening, changes that are happening. And if I, if a door closes, I knock and I realize that if it doesn't open, if it doesn't, if I, I knock again, you know, if I really want something, I keep knocking, but you know what? If that door doesn't open, there's a reason for it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not going to. I'm not going to force it down and I'm not going to say, well, this is none of the, none of what I believe is true. The door closed for a reason. And if you look back on your own life at doors that were closed, you had to in some way go around them and that going around them taught you something. It helped you learn something that eventually you used to become a better person, stronger person, more spiritual person. And that door closed, you know, that door that was closed was actually a great thing in your life. Mm -hmm. And so we can't look at closed doors or negative, what we perceive as negative circumstances or events or situations as negative because they usually end up being a positive. And if you can't see something that ended up being a positive for you, then I think you have to look at it differently. No, I I absolutely agree with you on that point. Um, You know, it's hard when you're, well, the the expression they used in the Texas legislature was, uh, it's hard to remember your first thought was to drain the swamp when you're up to your ass in alligators. And (laughs) the thing is, is, is when you're in the middle of something, it's really hard to remember, you know, don't be afraid, let it go. Uh, But once you do, and, and usually fairly quickly, you realize that that there was a reason you had to do that. There was a reason you had to to reach that block and go around it because there there is something else that you had to do. And it, and it's a very spooky feeling because you become profoundly aware that that you are being guided. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And you, and here's where I'm at. I, I, I've started to rely on those, what Joseph Campbell called invisible hands. Mm. He said, he said, and I listened to him and he's one of my greatest teachers. He said, you know, when you start to follow your bliss, right? When you start to live the type of life that you know is within you, that you right. have the potential for and that your life course is on. When you start to do that, invisible hands will come and help you along and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be doors. And so I said, I started to follow that and I started to say, and now I'm at the point where I do things almost on a whim saying, you know what, those invisible hands are going to come just like they've come already a million times. And I am going to jump off that building, not literally, but whatever that building is, whether it's, um, you know, writing a new book or, or anything in my life, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump and I know that before I hit the ground, those wings are going to pop out and I'm going to fly. And I, you know, coming to Spain, and as we were talking, I, 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 um, I, I moved to Spain. I, people were asking me, does you have a job lined up? Do you have anything? Do you have nothing? I had very little. And it was a big move. Mm. But I knew, I knew, I said, you know, I'm not worried. Uh, the invisible hands are helping me all the way. And I'm jumping off the this building and before I hit the ground, the wings are going to pop out. And that's exactly what's happened. You know, that's exactly what's happened. And not only that, I mean, I could, I could tell you story after story after story where mm-hmm. that's happened. So now I've come to depend on that. And that's an interesting thing as well. Like you said, it's almost spooky because, you know, you feel you're being guided. You yeah. feel that, you know, there's something there and you, and now I'm starting to rely on it. And that's a beautiful thing. Well, and, and you mentioned it with your experience moving to Spain, and, and mine moving to Indonesia was almost identical. The uh, everything that I did back home in Houston was was blocked. You know, I couldn't get anywhere. And when I made the decision to move to Indonesia, it was amazing. Things flew open, money came to my pocket, plane tickets landed in my hand, um, and I came here literally with one suitcase and six hundred dollars in my pocket, and just on a whim. And it is probably, I would say, among the top three or four things that I've ever done in my life, uh, in terms of of the benefits that I've received from it, just by shutting my eyes and, and going with the feeling. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's, you know, I think that that is what, um, um, what's his name? Nice said when he, yeah. uh, 
when he talked about a wheel rolling out of its own center, right. where you're living a life that's authentic to yourself. You're not molded. You didn't mold your life because they said you have to work 40 hours a week because they said you have to have a house and a dog and a wife and 2.2 kids mm. because they said that, you know, you have to baseball is a national pastime. And now, you know, and you have to watch that. I mean, that's the mold that they try to put you into because of whatever reasons they have. But, you know, Breaking out of that and saying, you know, I'm interested in, in archaeology and traveling and writing and researching and I'm going to do that and I'm going to find a way to make money doing it. Mm. And that's what I've done. That's my authentic life. And, and you've done the same. And that's a beautiful thing because as I said, you start to depend on it. You start to live your life from that center mm -hmm. and that center is who you are. Remember the rose window? It's the point in the middle. If you look at a rose window, it's, it's almost like this everything is coming from that point in the middle. It's the source. Right. You're a sorcerer, the concept of a sorcerer. All right. It's a magical a person who has control of magic. A sorcerer is simply somebody who lives out of the center of their being there. If you look at the rose window, all the light, all the flowers, all the beauty is coming from that center. Mm. And that center is your soul. That's who you are. That's the higher self. And so when you live from that point, that's when you've You've got it. You know, you've got, you've, you've found who you are and you know yourself, know thyself. And that's where, you know, that's a beautiful thing. And that's what the Masons, I think that's what the Freemasons encoded in the Gothic cathedrals as much as it's what the Egyptians encoded in their triptych temples and mm -hmm. the Mayans encoded in their triptych temples. And before I forget, don't listen to these, uh, you know, Mayanists are great great researchers and scholars and, and incredibly smart people. They got one thing really wrong though. The, all the bloody murder and sacrifice and killing and blood. I think that's what was from a much, much later civilization that really lost the teachings. Um, the, 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 uh, the stone masons who constructed the, the pyramids and the monuments and the temples and landmarks of Mexico and Guatemala, of course, and the other, um, and the other states near there were incredibly sophisticated, incredibly advanced. They had the teaching just as much as the Egyptians did. Mm -hmm. And they encoded that wisdom into their monuments. You know, one thing, Bernard, that I talk about in the book is we've fallen from a golden age. There was a golden age many, many thousands of years ago. And the Greeks talked about it and the ancient Hindus talked about it. Yep. We've fallen from that golden age. You know, the, the, if you look at the Hindus, for example, the Vedic writings described four declining ages, right? The golden age was the Satya. The silver age was the Treta. Mm -hmm. The bronze was the Gopara. And the iron age, the, the, Kali, the Kali Yuga age is the one we're living in now. Makes a whole lot of sense, you know? Because the more ancient you look, the more advanced things are. Look at Stonehenge. Look at Sacsayhuaman in Peru. Look at uh, Baalbek. Look at a lot of these ancient, uh, a lot of these ancient cultures have this, these incredible ruins in the past. The further you look, the more advanced the more ancient, the better cut stones they are, the, the bigger the stones, the more incredible the temples, right? That's, so many people, so many researchers now are saying that, that, that for instance, in Egypt, you know, they, they say the, uh, uh, the Bent Pyramid and the, uh, some of the others were uh, early, early versions, but more and more it appears that, that the degraded ones were the later ones. They were attempts to copy something that already existed. Uh, just like the, the, the Great Pyramid, the one they call Cheops, um, is far more precise, far better aligned than the other two on either side of it. Uh, and each one of the, the two side ones uh, are a few steps down from, from, the, uh, from the main one in the center. Uh, and that seems to be a theme that shows up just about anywhere where you find these ancient ruins is that the, the older ones are the more beautiful, the more glamorous, the more interesting, uh, and the more precise. And then as the uh, later uh, generations tried to copy it, they, they weren't finding the, the technique. They weren't doing it right. Yep. When we find that all around the ancient world and as we see history progress, Bernard, this is the most important and fascinating part as far as I'm concerned. You know, 
excuse me, as we see history progress, we see a fall, we see a, a slow, steady decline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why do we have what's called the dark ages? You know, shortly after the birth of Christianity, Europe goes through a tremendous dark age. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's to me meaningful. It's meaningful of something. Um, y you have, um, you had the period, you know, a few times people pointed out to me, well, what about the Gothic cathedrals? What about the Renaissance? The Renaissance is, the word means rebirth. Right. As you probably know, rebirth of the ancient wisdom. And that was a time period, um, when the, uh, the Europeans rediscovered this ancient wisdom. And I agree with that, but <clears throat> I think that what you're seeing is just basically the, you know, I, to me that doesn't mean anything because look what's happened since then. You know, we've we've fallen even much further from the Renaissance. Yeah. Um, and I think that that period, that time period, is just a very small flowering that was quickly extinguished. And part of what extinguished it, I think, is our technology. I think people look at our technology. That's the thing that tricks people. They say, "Wow, what are you talking about? This golden age? They didn't have electricity. They didn't have computers." Computers. You know, I don't think that technology equates with a high age. I think technology equates with a very low age. You know, um, Plato talked about how the invention of writing was a terrible thing because <laughs> – Men wouldn't use their memories anymore. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? I mean, that's fantastic because, and that never made sense to me for for a lot for a long time. I studied Plato in college. I was in my early twenties, and I actually minored in philosophy, and so that didn't make sense to me at the time. I never really equated it. I heard of the golden age, but I hadn't really been convinced at that point of it and its existence. And but slowly and very quickly after college, as I traveled more and more, that's when I started to realize, you know. Plato was right. There was a golden age. There was this Atlantis type culture that lived, you know, that's, that existed thousands of years ago. And the triptych is evidence of that. And there's other evidence that I've discovered as well. It's not just the triptych. I've, I've found a lot more, um, ancient cultural parallels that, uh, that I've decoded. It's not just the parallels that I point to and say, is this coincidence? No, I don't do that. Mm. I point to parallels and I show how those parallels point to a higher, uh, universal wisdom that was shared by different cultures that scholars claim were never in contact with each other. Well, and, and actually that's a great transition into uh, some of your other work, the uh, the God Self icon, uh, which is another motif that appears over and over and over again. And you've done a brilliant job of pointing that out. I'm, I'm waiting for your book to come out so I can read your whole uh, uh, thesis. But um, tell us a little bit about that. I'm, I'm looking at the web page now, and I see what appears to be uh, an image of a human in a certain context that appears again and again and again. And, of course, we'll put the link up for, for uh, the listeners. Um, tell us about that. What, what is the, uh, the God Self icon? Okay, so... The God Self icon is um, something that I discovered many years ago and began posting on my internet site. I had a, I have a URL called deepertruth.com. I've owned it for about 16 years. Mm -hmm. And so the God Self icon is very similar to the triptych in that, you know, number one, I found it. Uh, while I was traveling. Um, and number two, it exists in practically every ancient civilization. What it is, is it's the same icon. It's a human being with both arms outstretched mm -hmm. in a parallel way to the left and to the right. And the human being that's, that's holding, that's, has his or her arms outstretched is holding this something in, in both hands. And it's, it's usually the same something. Either they're staffs or serpents or animals or flowers or lotuses or whatever it is. They're holding the same thing in both hands symmetrically. Mm -hmm. So that when somebody like us looks on this God self icon, and that's a term that I came up with, the God self icon, and I'll explain in a second why. 
when somebody looks on this, they're seeing a perfectly symmetrical pose. Now, just to, you know, just to throw something out there, it's, if you look at the gate of the sun in Tiwanaku, Bolivia, mm-hmm. the gate of the sun is crowned with who scholars call Viracocha. And that's the gods. He's, he's in the shape of the god self icon. In fact, scholars knew about the, this god self icon. They call it the staff god. Throughout Peru, you find this in, in just about every single pre-Inca civilization across Peru, in the Chavin and the Moche, and, and in basically every one of them. There's not one that I haven't found it in. And it was the, bar none, it was the central uh, icon of ancient Peru. All the cultures had it. They all celebrated it. And it's, as you can see by the fact that it's crowning the door of the, um, of the gate of the sun in Tiwanaku, it's a very, very important symbol. And so I didn't just find it in Peru or, or Bolivia. I found it in Egypt. I found it in Greece. I found it in every civilization. Here now I'm in Spain. I find that before the Romans, there was a very advanced civilization that flourished on the Iberian Peninsula. And guess what? The god self icon is among the ruins. I haven't published anything about that yet, but it is upcoming in my book, as you mentioned. I have a book coming out in June on this. It's called The Missing Link. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a major, major discovery. If not, if not more important than the triptych, then at least equally as important as the triptych temple discovery that I put forward in Written in Stone. And by the way, this is actually published in my 2011 book, Written in Stone. It's in chapter nine, I think, of Written in Stone. I devoted a whole chapter to it because the, the icon has a similar meaning to the triptych. And that is when, you know, according to esoteric anatomy, and this is very, very, um, well entrenched in the occult tradition. No. The right side, you know, the body is symmetrical. As I was saying before, our occult anatomy teaches us that the right side of the body is identified as the male solar half Mm -hmm. and the left side of the body is identified as the female lunar half. Mm -hmm. (coughs) Excuse me. And so – and that's concept you find in every single ancient culture from the Maya to the Egyptians and it's taught in yoga of the Hindus that uh, you know the right and the left are, are basically the the polar opposites. Yeah. So when a human being stretches their arms out and they're grasping the same things in both hands sometimes you even see the um well I won't get to that yet but just to say what it is basically is it's a similar concept to the triptych which is you know, you're made of duality, just your physical body is made of duality, just like the universe is made of duality. You, you are like an apple that comes from an apple tree. And so your body is the duality. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the good and the evil, the right and the wrong, the male and the female. That's inside your body. You're a part, but, 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 and this is the important part, but that's not necessarily who you are. It's not necessarily who you are. You are something centered between them. And again, we're finding the center, the balance. And who is that? That's the real true you, the eternal soul you, the higher self you. A lot of times in the, in the God self icon depictions, the head will be surrounded by solar light or mm. in some, the head is beaming light in all directions. And that's because when you do – it's almost like a yogic stance. When you do um, uh, balance your opposites and, and, um, and uh, find your center between them, you have that illumination. You have that understanding that you're not your physical body and you will continue after you die just like you've been alive long before you were born. Mm-hmm. And so that's the message of the God Self Icon. Well, and, and something I gather looking at the photos on your page here, uh, there seems there seems to be an obvious triangle. The most of these figures have the outstretched hands, but then there's a disc, a sun disc, on top of the head, uh, which which obviously draws a line, it draws a triangle. Uh, but then something else I notice is that a lot of these characters look uh, androgynous. They're not really male. They're not really female. Uh, they seem to have characteristics of both. Uh, am I going off on the wrong tangent there? Or no, else? not at all. You hit it. Boom. Right smack on the head. You got it beautifully. 
Uh, I wish there's actually one depiction in Egypt of um, some people say it's the god Osiris. Some people say it's the god He or He, H-E-H. But there's a very important depiction of the god self icon in Egypt. And this, just like you say, it's in, he's sitting on a, it's on the back of a chair and, um, he's got the twin palm leaves in his hand and the palm leaves stand. Actually, the god Hay is his, he's the hieroglyph for eternity. Okay, so it matches up beautifully. Um, he's sitting or she or it's an androgynous being actually with long hair, right? That's the female part and right. the beard. That's the male part, just like you pointed out. Beautiful. It's golden, okay, which we, we think about gold. We think of the transmutation from lead into gold, right? Right. Which is the, the fine-tuning of our character, the elimination of the lower self and, you know, um, and focusing on the higher self. And the lower self, by the way, isn't just, you know, the lower self is the greed and the excesses and the, um, the violence that comes with our animal nature. And we have to subdue that. And we have to transmute that into the gold of the higher self. So the concept of gold is a symbol of finding the higher self. So that image, just like you pointed out, is an androgynous image. And it perfectly illustrates the concept, the teachings of the God Self icon because it's androgynous and because um, it's made of gold. It also sits on um, a hieroglyph called Neb, which I believe is the word for gold in Egypt. And or Lord, Lord and gold. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot uh, behind that one particular image, and I, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on it on my, in my book. I haven't seen that chapter in a while, but um, yeah, it's it's it all ties in. And one other thing, very quickly, that's pretty important is that this concept of the God Self icon, which, by the way, in the in the new world of the Americas, the uh, the scholars call it the staff god. Mm-hmm. In the old world, it's called the master of beasts or the mistress of beasts. So in other words, uh, scholars of the new world have already identified and known about it. They they have no idea how prolific it is, as I've pointed out in my work, in my articles, and in my book. They, they have no idea how prolific it is, but they've pointed it out. They know that it exists, and they believe it was um, diffusion that uh, that that caused it to be known everywhere. But in my book, what I point out is in the first book and in my articles and now in uh, The Missing Link, which focuses on the God Self icon, it's actually – it was known to um, Renaissance scholars and occultists. Mm-hmm. It's called the Rebus. It's, it was found in Materia Prima of Valentinus who published it in Frankfurt and I think uh, the early 1600s. 16, yeah. All right, so check this out. This is really important, and this is something that you might want to put on the screen. It depicts the God Self icon, but with two heads, and the right hand is male, and he's holding a compass, right? And it's right. capped by the sun, and the left side is female. She's holding a square, and the square is capped by the moon. So here we have a perfect demonstration or illustration of a more modern version of the God Self icon. And not only that, but an explanation of what the ancient God Self icon around the world really meant, meaning that the right side of the body is male and solar and symbolized in Freemasonry by the compass. And the left side of the body is lunar female and symbolized in Freemasonry by the square. And the idea is by holding them out toward the side, to both of them equally and symmetrically toward the side, you're really showing how, you know, I've balanced these twin sides. I've I've understood how to transmute my lead into gold. I've balanced the opposites and I've found that I am, you know, I remember who I am. I know who I am. I'm the God within. I'm the higher self. I'm a soul that's temporarily inhabiting an animal body. And I recognize that... <clears throat> That, you know, my life is caused by myself. I created my own life. I'm the ground and ultimate source of my own being. And that's it. That's everything. That's the major, major part of it. The third eye comes into this as well because... In Egypt, a lot of the God Self icons are crowned with the Aten symbol, which you pointed out. Right. I've 
my research shows that the Aten symbol is a symbol not only of the third of the soul within, but also of the awakened third eye. I did a few videos and I put an article on Graham Hancock's website, author Graham Hancock, who was wonderful enough to publish my article. Um, in my book, in Written in Stone, and in my research, and on my websites, I've for many years been saying that the Aten symbol is the third eye symbol, mm-hmm. and the idea is uh, the Egyptians. Uh, when they depicted a god self icon, which they did, m- you know, many, many, many times in the sarcophagi and in papyrus and stuff, basically what they did was they put that god self icon so that the left eye and the right eye kind of line up with the left hand and the right hand, and then the head has crowned on top of it the Aten, which is the third eye dot, like the Bindi, the the Bindi dot in India. Right. Only in Egypt, it was the same exact symbol. Only in Egypt, it's the the Aten. And dot, the the awesome. awesome. And just like with the cathedrals, how we talked about before, the, the rose window right. crowns the center door of the Gothic cathedrals, and the rose window is a symbol of not only of the soul, but of the third eye that awakens and sees the soul within. Same in Egypt. You know, that that Aten symbol is not only a symbol of the soul, it's a symbol of the awakened third eye that sees the soul within. Well, and, and this brings up some interesting uh, tie-ins with... Uh, uh, traditional Christian uh, uh, art from Europe, uh, for instance, like uh, what they call blessed. They're not quite saints, but they're not. They're definitely above us. Uh, they're often depicted in icons as having a triangle-shaped um, halo, whereas somebody who has ascended, a saint or or a deity, has a circular uh, halo. Uh, as if they've attain, attained uh, infinity themselves. And then when you were talking about the, the image of the uh, God Self icon, I, I was thinking of the uh, famous painting uh, by Raphael about the ascension of Jesus. And he's standing, he's floating in air with his hands outstretched. Uh, and in this case, the, the, uh, piercings in his hands from the nails are the two things that he's holding or the two things that are balancing him um, I mean the, uh, everything you're saying is is so infused into our culture that we don't even see it anymore yep that we don't even see it that's right yep we don't even see it anymore and that's you know going back to what I was saying before you know we're taught that all the mysteries have been solved mm-hmm. and all the that's something that I've, you know, if I, I ever, always when I talk to young people, I say, there's a great discovery waiting for you to make it, you know, you, but I don't know, you know, I'm, what are you interested in biology? Oh, there's so much to be discovered. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. See their eyes light up. Their eyes light up like that, the, at the, pos- at the idea that it's possible that they could discover. So I, that's the one thing that I have against the Western education system that, you know, especially for example, Egyptology, you know, look at the, these Egyptologists who I have great respect for, but who I often put down because they have this idea that, you know, we've pretty much figured it all out. No way, no way, not even close. They're not even close. And so the idea that they're kind of hoarding the, um, the ability to point things out. If I went to an Egyptologist and I showed him my book, they wouldn't really be as interested as a normal person who has an open mind because the Egyptologist has to kind of protect his reputation or protect the integrity of the past 60 years or 70 years of scholarship where everything is supposedly neatly um, packaged. Um, packaged out, you know, mm-hmm. laid out to the public. And once somebody comes along and blows all that away, I think that's when you're going to see some major, major uh, revision and discoveries made, not only in Egyptology, but with everything. And that's why you know, it's so important for young people to be to hear that message that none of this is figured out by anybody and that you're here to figure it out and make all kinds of discoveries because that's what you know, that's what I think part of what we're here for is to be creative, you know, to, to creatively discover things and to creatively put things together the way, you know, to put truth together and to find truth or at least what we believe in or as much truth as we can believe, you know, limited with our five senses and, and right. limited with the, you know, the abilities that we have. Well, it's <sighs> – I mean, there's so many things to talk about in the, in this con in this uh, context. The uh, one thing that does give me a lot of hope, though, is it seems like uh, many 
scholars now in different disciplines are starting, the, especially the younger ones, are starting to question the old rote uh, uh, information. I won't call it knowledge. I'll call it information. Uh, that's been pounded into everybody's head and is protected because, you know, they spent – four to eight years studying and millions of dollars and all this thing. And, of course, they're going to protect it. But now these these younger people seem to be um, questioning that and getting more into uh, what could be or, or different interpretations, I guess, is a better way of looking at it. Yeah, you know, and that's it. You know, People don't have to believe. They have to just keep an open mind. I think that what really makes an intelligent person is not their ability to discover these things like I'm discovering them. I think really the the way you really judge, or at least the way I judge somebody's level of intelligence, is their ability to keep an open mind on things. And that doesn't mean they believe everything they hear because that's that's dumb, I think. No, you, know, you can't just believe everything you hear, right? But just the ability to entertain an idea. A lot of times I get contacted a lot by a lot of different people that say, you're going to think I'm crazy. And I say, never. I, I'm <laughs> open-minded to whatever you say. I'm, I have an open mind to it. You could tell me what it is and I'll, I'll say, no, I don't think I believe that. You know, you put forth the evidence. I don't believe the evidence, but, you know, thanks for trying. But you know what? At least I have an open mind toward things. And I think that as you're pointing out, a lot of the younger generations have that open mind, and that's a great thing that they that that separates them from, you know, the older scholars who, like we talked about, are protecting the um, the established view, the mainstream view, and partly I think they're protecting that. I think. You know, I see a lot of, I see a lot of manipulation and I see a lot of control of information and I see mm-hmm. a lot of these universities and, you know, Western universities mainly controlling information, controlling the flow of information, controlling who gets to see the information mm-hmm. and who gets to comment on it. You know, that's one thing I like the internet for. The internet has broken that down and now you can sort of go directly to the public like I'm doing with my findings, with my discoveries mm-hmm. and people are building on it, which is good. You know, they're, they're contacting me and they're saying, Hey, did you find this God self icon? Or, Hey, look at this triptych. Or, Hey, do you think it's possible that we could use the triptych to try to find secrets of biology or secrets of anatomy or whatever it would be? And I'm, these are things that I didn't even think of. And I think it's fantastic. And, and I say, you know, I endorse what you're, what you're doing. Do it. Find it. That, you know, that's a fantastic thing. I think it's very possible. So. I think that's one thing that the internet is doing well and I think that's a big difference between the young and the and the older establishment ones mm-hmm. that are preserved that are trying to um trying to control the knowledge and control what people are really thinking and I see that being a very positive change that's that's underway now with the internet. Oh, I do as well. The the internet is is an amazing invention. It is absolutely incredible. Uh, for anybody that that has any interest in in anything, uh, you know, I, I think about the old days of having to run down to the library and you brought your list of books with you and you had to go through all the stacks and you know if you're lucky you got one day a week that you could actually get down there and do all this and then you, you check the oh and checking the books out and having your library card and have to bring it back in two weeks and all this stuff and now I can just sit down and if I have a thought I can click it into a search engine and I'm there. Isn't that great? Remember the card catalog? Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> I remember that vividly. <laughs> Me too. Me too. And what a difference now, right? What a difference. And of course, we have to watch out, you know, because you know, as, as Prince Charles, I wrote an article on him recently. I took a lot of flack for it. Oh, he's he's the worst animal in the world, and you know. But listen, I mean, we all have good and bad, and you know, what would you do if you were him? What would you do? Are people, oh, I would cause a revolution. Well, maybe, but he didn't. But that doesn't make him an evil guy. I don't believe half the stuff that's written about him. Mm. But I did see that he gave a conference to the Sacred Web. Uh, Sacred Web. He did a he did a speech. He gave a speech to the Sacred Web Conference in 2006 that I wrote an article about on my website because it was really a brilliant speech where he talked about a lot of the things that we're talking about. He talked about um, mainly how a return to tradition and the concept of spirituality is what we need at this point in these troubled times. He talked about a return to the perennial philosophy, which I completely agree with. But one of the things that he talked about was 
the idea that you know we have at the at literally the push of a button our access to knowledge yeah. or access to information i should say right and he warned though that you know information it might be knowledge but knowledge is not wisdom and so i think what we're seeing also today is in a negative way we're seeing a lot of knowledge you know passed around like knowledge you know but not wisdom behind it let me let me say this and i'm not bitter about it at all but the amount of copying of my material that I've seen is unbelievable. And I've seen, you know, literally famous authors, people that are, you know, more famous than me. And I can see sentences. An author knows his own work. I can see sentences and ideas that are just completely copied, no credit given. But I noticed that they didn't have... They, they might have been able to copy the idea of the balance of the opposites or the sun and the moon and finding the center and that. But, you know, they missed some key part of it. And I say, you know, they had the knowledge. OK, they, they copied the knowledge. They read my book or they read my article and they basically used word for word what I said. And they, they decided not to provide a citation, which is fine. It happens all the time now. Right. But you know what? They don't have the real wisdom that comes with it. They, they're lacking that wisdom. They can copy the knowledge, but they don't have the wisdom and they're not sharing the wisdom. And that's, you know, that's something that that part gets me a little. If they had provided the citation, okay, somebody who's reading their work then would say, you know, I like what he's saying, but I'm really feeling that there's more here. He provided us author citation to Richard Cassaro. Let me go check this guy out. And that's where they'd find the, the deep wisdom because this isn't something that I copy. This is something that I completely put together on my own. I've, my whole life I've been into this. It's, this isn't something that I got turned on to five years ago or ten years ago. Right. I've been collecting parallels of ancient civilizations ever since I'm a young teenager. I've been studying the concepts um, of the occult ever since I was you know, literally 13 years old listening to heavy metal, you know, like <laughs> I'm getting into it, you know, like I had the black magic. Yeah, this is great. But, you know, I wasn't into it in an evil way. My friends, we, we were looking into it because we were curious about it. We were the mysticism, the mystery, the darkness, the cool lyrics, the, the heavy beats, the metal. You know, that's what really, uh, that's a part of it that I got, that got me really into this as well. And, you know, where it dropped off for my friends, they got interested in, in sports or whatever it was. And I just continued down this path and, and it really got stronger and stronger and stronger for me. So I really feel like uh, at this point, and especially having joined a lot of different um, a lot of different fraternities and organizations, I'll join anything. People say, well, you're, you joined. I joined everything. I'm looking for truth. I don't care what it is. I, if I think I'll find some nook or cranny, I'm going in. Mm -hmm. And I can come back out and if somebody says, well, once you join, you're joined for life. Well, I could, maybe I won't go to the meetings anymore. Maybe I won't say anything. I don't have to be anything for life. You know, there's Rosicrucians lodges that I joined. There's Freemasonry lodges that I joined. There's theosophical organizations that I joined. I was a member of the ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment in New York City. I mean, I don't think twice, oh, well, what will they say about me if they say, if they found out that I joined? I don't care. I'm on my search for truth. Well, they'll I'm probably end up stealing your materials, but they'll say. <laughs> You know, it's happening a lot. It's happening more and more. And yeah. you know what it is? Is I'm on Facebook. I got on Facebook about a year, uh, about yeah, about a year and a half ago, and that's when I really, when I got on, people were linking to me and saying, "Look at this. They they used your article without permission, mm. or they used your photos." And you know, luckily I have really good readers and really close, you know, people who really stick up for me, sure. and that means a lot to me. And I couldn't believe it at first that people that I didn't even know were were defending me in, in, in these Facebook pages and, and groups and things like that, you know, arguing people saying, don't put the link to this material without citing the author. His work is completely original. And, you know, I didn't understand much of it at first, but now after using the, this social media, um, Facebook and, and mostly Facebook, I'm also on Twitter and, and YouTube, but mostly Facebook now. People really, I'm, I'm just thrown back. I'm so thankful that I have such you know, such friends and people behind me that care and that recognize the authenticity of the work and my authenticity as somebody who's trying to bring the work 
to the public and trying to bring as much of it freely as I can. You know, the best I say for the book, I don't have, you know, people think, oh, well, what do you have in the book? It looks like you have everything on yours. And no, no, no. There's a lot in the book that you don't find on the website. And people write me all the time. They say, oh, I read your book. Now I didn't, now I know what you're talking about where you say you save the best for the book. Mm-hmm. And I do. But I also like to give a lot of information for free because, you know, it helps also with, uh, with marketing. People are really interested. If they read a really good article from you, then they buy your book. So, it's it's good for that as well. Mm-hmm. No, uh, well, and going back to your whole point on balance, uh, the internet is a perfect example, and what you're saying is is you know exactly that balance that some people are going to to borrow liberally from from other people's work, and then other people are going to defend you. So the the internet is a perfect example of of this this balance that that comes through life if you just let it. Mm-hmm. It's there. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's true. And there's a good, there's a lot of great information, valuable information, oh, sure. truthful information on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, right, what do we have is a lot of, you know, ridiculous, false, you know, misleading and misunderstood information. And, you, you know, I think young people have to, I think the young people know too. A lot of people know that you can't, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. You got to be real careful. Take it with a grain of salt. Well, you know, the younger you are, the better your BS meter is. After a while, uh, when you get older, you kind of get calcified and <laughs> you start start dismissing anything that doesn't fit into your worldview. But but I think, um, you know, when, when people are in their teens and early 20s, they, they're still open enough that uh, they accept information, but they're also suspicious enough that, that they uh, call a spade a spade when they see it. And that's very good. Yeah, and that's a that's a great quality, and that's a, a that's something that they should teach. You know, and they should um, try to cultivate and foster in people and young people is is you know to look within themselves and learn how to look within yourself. It's I I for me I've found that the answers are all within us. We've we all know the answers. We all yeah. we all have the information. We all have that connection to source, and it's just a matter of. You know what? What the old timers kind of call your gut feeling. You know, right. go with your gut. You know, what does your gut tell you? And that's that's a really important uh, teaching. You know, go with your gut instinct. Go with what you feel is is. And of course, you talk to scientists and and people are oh, you know, what do you mean? What do you feel? This isn't about feeling. It's about facts. Well, that's where the the disconnect is between modern modernism and and traditionalist the traditionalist view. Well, and, uh, and what you know the the eureka moment the the thing where you have that clarity that sudden moment of clarity is exactly a nonlinear moment is when you make a leap uh between multiple multiple subjects looking at, at a at a single problem and suddenly all these connections appear in your mind uh that you have to go back, you know, the the whole part of the research is to go back and, and prove what you just saw. But the fact of the matter is that it's a leap of faith when you make that that eureka connection. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And that's the beautiful part of it. You know, that's the part where I think we experience, we get a glimpse of eternity, our own eternal nature. In that, in that realization, in that moment, in that sublime moment, I think I heard... Joseph Campbell talking about that. Oh yeah, right. This that moment of clarity, that moment of that. It's a sublime moment, and um, like you called it, the eureka moment. You know that I think is the moment where we touch eternity. You know, it truly, truly, truly. I, well, and it's something you can't teach. What you can do is is you give people the framework uh, and let them and let them build on it, but you can never teach them how to have a eureka moment. It's just something that comes. Uh, but unfortunately, the schools anymore are just not, they're not educating. They're, they're making people memorize stuff that is pointless. But I could go yeah. on, I could go on on that topic for ages, but. I could too, you know, and it's just <laughs> sad, sad thing. That's why I'm so happy I pulled my son out of that system, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, 
And, you know, I think too, a lot of parents, you know, we, we have, we're the responsible ones for teaching our children. We can't leave it to a school. A school is good to help them learn how to read and write and basic mathematics. And they need that, you know, we need to make a living. So it kind of squares away nicely there. But, you know, we also have to teach them along every single day and teach them what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, just as an example, I, I, I had my son growing up, he's eight years old now, but growing up, I would, I would tell him, and I never tried to indoctrinate him. Very important. I, I don't want him to repeat what I say. I want him to, I'm trying to teach him to learn how, how to think for himself. Bingo. And so I would tell him what commercials would come on TV and I would explain to him they're trying to sell you things. And he picked that up at an early age and we used to play this game, you know, a commercial would come on and I'd say, what are they trying to sell you here? And he'd say, sneakers, you know, <laughs> what are they trying to sell you here? The cars, you know, so uh, the church and ask him, what are they trying to sell there? Yeah. You know, so what are they, so it's in a way it's good. We all have to make a living, et cetera, et cetera. But I want him to be careful. I, I'm trying to teach him at a young age, not to um, be brainwashed by yeah. anybody, yeah. including me, including me. Don't, you know, don't listen to me. I tell him, don't listen to me. Don't, I have my ideas. You're a different person. You're going to have your own ideas. This is what daddy thinks. You think what you think, but I'm the one here to guide you into teaching you how to think for yourself. I see a lot of parents, uh, especially growing up in New York, gosh, their kids, they're all wearing Yankee shirts. They all have to play baseball. They all, <laughs> even though some of them suck, you know, yeah, it's like, look, yeah. kid sucks at baseball. He's never going to be a baseball player. You were the greatest. You, we all, you're legendary in the neighborhood, but your kid is not. Stop forcing him. You know, the kid's crying and you could see he's terrible. You know, maybe he's not made for that. You can't, you can't craft your children into be replicas of yourself. You know, they're completely different people and they're going to grow up a completely different path that you took so you know i think that's a, that's kind of a um an important thing also to teach young people is is that you know everybody has their own path and you know <coughs> excuse me that's mm -hmm. you know just something that popped in my head <laughs> sorry well you know to to my father's horror instead of wanting to play football which in texas is a religion um you know i wanted to do things like uh, uh Audition for the, the school play, and I wanted to to learn how to paint, and you know I, I had no interest whatsoever in sports. But to his credit, he he gave me the space to do what I wanted, and it turned into a career. So <laughs> that's good. That's nice. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, Rich, yeah, I had open-minded parents too, and all very understanding yeah. parents as well, and they gave me the space and the support that I needed. You know, very skeptical sometimes, but you know, the 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 moral support, the the idea that you know you're on your own path, and mm. you know we wouldn't want to make you into something that we want you to be. We want you to do what you want to do. It's your life, and you have to live up to the consequences of it. And that's a good thing, I think. So, yeah, I would I would agree with that. And you're living proof that that's the right way to. You know, handle handle young people, handle children. Well, and hopefully my children feel the same way about me. So, but I'm sure they do. You know, I've I've kept you now for about an hour, and uh, we we've kind of ranged all over the place in this conversation. It's been really really fascinating uh, talking with you. Uh, but I want to give you a moment to. Uh, to point people out to where they can get more information, uh, tell them about your books, how they can get on your social media. Uh, how, how do we find you? Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Bernard, it's a, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I had a really great time, great conversation as well. Very interesting topics that we touched on, and thank you very much. And my main website is richardcasaro.com, and I have my book written in stone, published in 2011, where you can learn more information on the triptych and it's um, how it uh, originated from antiquity and has been proliferated through Freemasons and other secret societies. Mm -hmm. And I have a new book coming out in 2016, which is the year we're in right now in June, which is about a month and a half away. It's called The Missing Link. And this book focuses on the God Self icon which is basically a spin-off of chapter nine of written in stone. Cause I talk about the God self icon in mm -hmm. chapter nine of written in stone. So both books, uh, you'll be able to purchase on richardcasaro.com. And I believe I'm going to put the missing link 
on Amazon.com, which I didn't do with Written in Stone. Written in Stone is a book that is not available on Amazon. It's only available on RichardCasaro.com. But mm. uh, the new book, The Missing Link, will be available on both. Beautiful. Are any of these uh, uh, hardcover or are they, they all electronic or how do you publish Written in Stone is a hard is a, is a paperback. It's paperback, not published okay. as an ebook at all. Yeah, it's you have to order it and it has to come through the mail. That's Written in Stone. Okay. And um, the missing link because it's going to have somewhere upwards of 500 photos in it, all of the God Self icon and other uh, related images. It, there was no way I could actually uh, print that out as a, as a hardcover or, or a paperback and send it through the mail. It would it would it's too cost prohibitive. So I'm mm-hmm. making that an e book and an ebook only mm. so at least for now that's what's that's what i'm doing so um yeah that's what that one's going to be an ebook it's going to be available on amazon and on my website together so um i hope that uh people look forward to that well absolutely fantastic and, and as i mentioned at the at the beginning um reading your stuff was was a I had my own eureka moment reading a lot of your your work, uh, so I, I dearly hope that that members of the audience will go and and check out your material, look at your books. Uh, I think um, I think they'll find that there's there's a lot of a lot of meat on the bone, as it were, uh, for research and for thinking. And I I do appreciate your work and and thank you for your time to come on. Thank you so much, Bernard. That's very nice. That's very nice of you to say. I really appreciate that. I appreciate the support. I appreciate you having me on, and thank you so much. My pleasure. The evidence continues to grow that our history is much older and more complex than we imagine. Rich's work and that of many other top researchers reveal a fascinating tale that is literally written in stone all around us. I encourage you to listen to our interview with Joseph Farrell on the origins of the Trinity for additional information that complements this discussion. Be sure to visit our other outlets and follow our efforts to cut through the haze and get to the truth that is our rightful heritage. We especially encourage folks to leave the corporate geezer media behind and join things like Steemit and DTube to support real free speech and uncensored inquiry. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe, like, and share. And we'll see you in the jungles. Sampai jumpa, y'all.